world was fine and the sun did shine on this chart of November 1989. Music to match the seasons turning, this chart like the beachside car park burning, and the radio hits they flowed like summer wine. Well, that didn't make any sense, but whose poetry does anyway? They say false poets aspire to fame and true poets to glory, but in the age of Twitter, there's no such thing as glory. Here's the top 10 from the week ending November 12th, 1989. Well, we have to start somewhere, and this being a top 10, 10 is as good a place as any. So number 10 this week is Listen to Your Heart by Roxette, from the land of the supremely boring poet Thomas Transturmer, who won the 2011 Nobel Prize for Literature in what was, by honouring a local, a transparent attempt by the Swedish Academy to save on cab fares. Now, I don't know about literature, but if they gave the Nobel Prizes for power balladry, well, it'd be a pretty motley collection of ne'er-do-wells on the winner's roll, except for Roxette, who would surely have won for this. It's the rarest of records, a glossy late 80s ballad that A doesn't feature Phil Collins, and B doesn't fill you with a desire when it comes on the radio to change the station, go up and get a cup of coffee, or plough your car into a tree at great speed. God bless the good ship Roxette and all who sail on her. Number 9 is, however, the unpleasant corollary to number 10 and a reminder that while the 80s gave us Walkmans, Olivia Newton-John in spandex and Ronald Reagan, it also gave us Moral Panics, Ugly Cars and Richard Marks. It's not strictly accurate to call Right Here Waiting a power ballad as it has the power of a hippopotamus which eats nothing but mayonnaise. That said, it did spend five, count them people, five weeks at number one back in September to the first week of October. Number eight. Martika was a flash in the pan in the late 80s, running a few songs up the charts. The most successful was a two-week US number one in Toy Soldiers, which spent eight weeks in our top 10, 22 weeks on the chart, for a top of number five. Some years later and some years ago, she toured Australia with an 80s package tour crammed with bits and pieces of various broken bands of the era. I didn't see it, but I'm reliably informed she blew men without hats off stage. 7. Make way for the unadulterated class of Tina Turner with her anthemic reading of The Best, a song which through an advertising campaign here in Australia is forever associated with the National Rugby League competition. A slow, smouldering soul stomper, Turner is in superb voice, a voice that after a long career was at its peak in the 10 years from the mid 80s to the mid 90s. The ultimate tribute to the mighty Tina Turner is, however, that she was the only act that James Brown ever refused to go on after. Number six, in the late 80s through to the early 90s, Jenny Morris was a welcome and tuneful presence on the charts. Having come across from New Zealand to appear on the soundtrack of the legendary coming-of-age film Puberty Blues and consolidating her rep as a backup singer for In Excess, Morris then had a great run of high-quality hits and two very fine albums. She's Got to Be Loved, this week's entry, was towards the end of that run, which saw her win the ARIA Best Female Award in 1987 and 88 to add to her New Zealand equivalent award in 1982. But tragedy struck when she began to lose her battle with spasmodic dysphonia, a condition which causes an unpredictable paralysis of the vocal cords, and she began to tailor her output around her young family and singing what she wanted to sing, which meant she wasn't breaking into the top 40 so much anymore. However, she stayed active and respected in the industry and was, until late 2022 I believe, Chair of the Australian Performing Rights Association. It's time for hello and goodbye. The time out we take to say goodbye to the departed and welcome the latest members of the Top 10 Club. Well, new to the 10 this week is Listen to Your Heart by Roxette, which is the second time that noble band has featured in our series. 10 was also as good as got here, dropping to 11 next week and then back in at 10, thenceforth to walk the long, slow walk of shame from the chart. Already commencing that walk was All I Want Is You by U2. It's fashionable nowadays to bag on U2. They're boring, pretentious, Bono is a wanker and what have you. But to be fair, there were all these things back in 1986. The next number one hit on the chart hadn't made its debut. The current number one actually occupied the top slot until the end of the year. 
Back on the long road to number one, and we have in fifth spot Billy Joel with the slightly ridiculous We Didn't Start the Fire, his schoolhouse rock version of Subterranean Homesick Blues. Joel was riding high at the time, but this was to be his penultimate top ten hit of nine with two number ones before he decided he had better things in life to do than be a top rock star married to a gorgeous supermodel. Good for him, I guess. At four, we have Grayson Hugh, one of the most interesting dudes we have ever had in our series. His resume is too varied and too bizarre to fit in this little vignette, but since the early 80s, this musical polymath has been a Dr. John-style R&B merchant, a composer for modern ballet troops, a sweet-voiced soul man, a hopeless drunk twice, a backup singer, movie soundtrack provider, and an unlikely hit record maker. Talk It Over was originally written for Living Newton-John, who had a minor hit with it here in Australia, but Hugh's version swept all before it, peaking at four and spending 22 weeks in the top 40, as well as dominating morning and evening playlists on top 40 stations. He went on to further adventures and whatever the hells he wanted to do, and does so to this very day. Number three is Alice Cooper with his big comeback hit after spending almost the entire of the 1980s in a bibulous blur. Whatever you think of producer-songwriter Desmond Child, hot off jet-propelling Bon Jovi to the top, and his patented pop metal style, it must be said that this is just the kind of record Cooper needed to showcase and refocus his undoubted talent. He's made many better records since then, and truth be told, he even made some better records during his drunk-ass decade. But Poison is a loud, rowdy, radio-friendly welcome back to one of rock's most beloved performers. At number two, from the jewel of South Yorkshire, Rotherham, from which no band of note has ever emerged, came Les Hemstock, who along with the guy in a rabbit suit was Jive Bunny and the Master Mixers. Swing the Mood was one of those only of its time at that time novelty records that unaccountably sold a zillion copies and never got played again once it fell off the charts. I had to listen to it on Spotify to remember it. Even then it made no impression on me, although there's probably dusty copies in many people's guilty pleasures piles of 45s as the record did spend three weeks atop the charts. It's Fall's Fantastic World of Facts. Some people say follow the science that isn't science, and some say follow the facts that barely qualify as facts. We say fight to the science and repeat to Fowl's Fantastic World of Facts. Biggest mover this week is the supremely annoying Ride on Time by Black Box, which rose 16 places to number 16 while the biggest drop of this week in a somewhat static chart was the Michael Hutchins side hustle Max Q, which dropped six spots to number 30. Highest debutante this week, in fact, the only debutante this week, was Joe Cocker's When the Night Comes, which poked its nose in at number 39 and promptly vanished from the chart next week. The longest charting record this week is Funky Cold Medina by Tone Loke, which topped out at number eight and lingered thus far for 18 weeks. Nice. Number one in the USA was the exemplar power ballad When I See You Smile by Bad English, which, while not featuring Phil Collins, does make you want to plow your car into a tree at a great rate of knots when it comes on the radio. And in the land of Toodle Pip and Toad in the Hole, it was Lisa Stansfield with All Around the World. Stansfield had a number of further top tens in the UK, but apart from this one making number nine, it was over and out for her here, top 10 wise in Australia. Looking back a year, one of the iffiest number ones ever, Bobby McFerrin's cloying Don't Worry Be Happy, was in the middle of a seven week run at number one, and next year, the number one for the week would be the previously maligned Jukebox in Siberia by the once proud Skyhawks. For the band that gave us Baldwin calling, you just like me because I'm good in bed and ego is not a dirty word, to have fallen to this kind of trite novelty, well, someone in that band must have really needed some money quickly. That said, their next comeback single, Happy Hippie Hut, was truly despicable, and the tour that was meant to accompany it received such poor ticket sales that it was downgraded from an arena stadium tour to pubs. 
The number one album about this time was Stormfront by Billy Joel. It's a bit of a rebound from the previous album, The Bridge is a Gloomy Atmosphere, and the songcraft, always Joel's strength, is as good here as anywhere in its catalogue. I didn't actually mind The Bridge. Well, there we have it, and now it's time for the funky monkey, the ape who's in tip-top shape and the primate who's just great. Monty the safety monkey to drum us into number one. Monty, beat them damn things like they owe you money. Number one is Cher with her huge hit If I Could Turn Back Time. While Alice Cooper hooked up with the then uber hot Desmond Child, Cher reached out to the other titan of late 80s into the 90s bombastic schlock, Diane Warren, or more correctly, Diane Warren reached out to her. Warren was a hit machine at the time, writing to date 32 US top 10 hits and 10 number ones. The song was also helped by a provocative video which featured Cher wearing more wig than actual clothes and cavorting such that MTV were forced to show the video after 2100. The video was filmed on the USS Missouri, the battleship on whose quarterdeck the Empire of Japan surrendered, thus ending World War II. Cher, as usual, stridently oversings it, and the public, as usual, lapped it up, sending it to the top for seven weeks and making it one of those rare records to lose and then regain the number one spot, succumbing for three weeks, as it did to Jive Bunny. And there we have it, folks. Thanks for stopping by, and if the good lords will and the creeks don't rise, we'll have another edition next week-ish. See you then.